My guest today is Jeremy Lickness. Jeremy, how you doing? I'm doing great. How long has it been since you've been on my show? Uh, I want to say five, ten years. It's five or ten years. Holy we were cow, talking Silverlight. Silverlight. So this is like a golden oldie. It is. Uh, let's talk about something more modern than Silverlight. Okay. Uh, which, which may or may not ever come back. Uh, it may come back in a different form. Different so form, yeah. disguised. <laughs> so. Um, but, uh, what do you want to talk about? I want to talk about Blazor. Blazor. What is that? Blazor is a framework uh -huh. for building full stack web apps uh -huh. in the browser using C Sharp and .NET. Cool. Client side uh, code. Client running, side client code. side C Sharp code running inside the browser. Right. But does my browser understand C Sharp? I Your browser it, has no clue what C Sharp is, uh -huh. but there's this Blazor does. magic new feature that is shipped with all modern web browsers called WebAssembly, ah. which is basically, you can think of it as a, a virtual sandbox. It's a virtual machine, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have any interaction with the DOM or the aspects of HTML. It's just code, byte code that runs on a stack-based machine. Hmm. But because of that, the team has been able to compile a version of the .NET framework that runs on top of WebAssembly, which means it gives us access to running .NET in browsers. And this is something that is stable release WebAssembly and currently in desktop edge browsers as well as mobile edge browsers. Oh, nice. Uh, and so let me uh, understand this model here. Uh, the browser understands WebAssembly. WebAssembly also doesn't understand C Sharp, but it understands compiled code. Correct. And you can compile your C Sharp down to, you know, the ones and zeros or you know, Yeah, you, you can. It's, it's actually an interesting history because about five years ago, a feature came called ASM.js. Okay. And what this did is it took a subset of JavaScript and defined sort of a virtual machine using constraints so that you could only use certain constructs. Like you don't do for loops in ASM.js, you do while one loops. Okay. And the reason why is because it's for optimizations. Oh, so just, is that the only reason that it existed? It was just to run, make JavaScript run a lot faster? Uh, it was actually designed as a, a target. So there's a, a set, a tool chain called LLVM, which I won't get into too much detail, but basically is designed to help build portable application. So if I can compile to LLVM, there's a good chance I can compile and target Linux, I can compile and target Windows. Mm -hmm. And so a team was able to tap into that tool chain and create a process that initially you could compile C and C++ code into this ASM.js and run it in the browser. And it was designed to have optimized code paths. Oh, so okay. So JS was sort of a, a misdirection there. It wasn't yeah. JavaScript. It was well, well, it was, it was JavaScript, but it, again, it's a subset of JavaScript designed to be optimized. And just mm -hmm. a, a very simple example is if I wanted to find an integer in ASM.js, mm -hmm. I would take a value and pipe it, do an exclusive or with zero. Now, if I do that with JavaScript that doesn't understand ASM.js, exclusive oring a variable basically just removes the fractional piece of it. Hmm. And in, in legacy JavaScript, all numbers are stored as floating point. Mm -hmm. And floating point math is a lot more overhead than integer math, so okay. it's not as optimized. For browsers that, which is all modern browsers that understand ASM.js, those are able to take that convention of exclusive or with zero and say, oh, you intend for this to be an integer. Hmm. And then the JavaScript engine optimizes for an integer under the covers instead of a floating point. Okay. So you get that performance boost. I see. And then what WebAssembly does is it just takes it a step further and says, let's no longer be constrained by JavaScript as a language and create a bytecode to do what we want to do in hmm. the browser. Wow. Uh, and so where does Blazor fit into this? So a team back in 2017, so just a couple years ago, was able to take Mono and build to WebAssembly as a target. Oh. And so this successfully got .NET running in the browser without plugins. The problem is it's still a black box. There's not much you can do with that code except call out to it and get something back. So what Blazor oh, oh, does... Oh, meaning that it doesn't have access to the web page it's running in. C correct. Okay. Yeah. 
And so what Blazor does is Blazor stands on top of that and creates all of the services needed to build a full application experience. Oh. And it's pretty brilliant the way that they decide to pursue it because we already have MVC Razor templates. So we already have a templating engine that allows us to create templates and mm -hmm. emit HTML based on C Sharp constructs. Right. And so they took that exact same engine and implemented it so that it can render those pages in the browser. Oh, so the pages look a lot like the ASP.NET-MVC pages that use Razor. Right, exactly. In fact, you can create a Razor class library mm -hmm. and share those pages and logic between a server-side application or a client-side application. So there's a lot of code reusability being leveraged here. What, uh, when you say a server-side application, what? Uh, like an MVC work. app, for uh, example. Oh, okay. So, so I can you use pre-generate your pages and then just right. send them down to the browser. Exactly. Well, an interesting nuance is that Blazor WebAssembly is still in preview. That's the client-side version. Okay. And uh, there's a few reasons for that. There's a lot of optimization, some debug experience, some other things that need to be done before it's really production ready. Hmm. So the team as a stopgap created this what's called server-side blazer which is in full production mode hmm. and it's really just a flag that you flip what server-side blazer does is the rendering engine is decoupled from all the logic underneath it and so it sets up a really thin client in the browser that uses signal r sockets to communicate with the server oh. and so the server is actually rendering the pages and sending the fragments out to the client so think of it as a thin client the server's doing the work but you can basically just flip a flag and switch from that server side to client side and so there's actually a lot of people who are using server side as a stopgap because it's supported in production until the WebAssembly version is uh, released, which the team is targeting right now, May of 2020 for that. Oh, so that's interesting. So is in May of 2020, when the client-side version is available, does that mean people uh, will stop using the server-side, that there really isn't an advantage to using that, or, or does that still have some purpose? Um, that still has some purpose. There's, there's trade-offs between the two, and it depends on if you want your workloads really scaling on the server versus in the client, oh, okay. and it also depends on if you want offline support. So Blaze, Blazor runs just like any other web app. So it, had, it can be implemented as a progressive web application. It can run in offline mode, but you lose that if you're using the server side version. Okay. So customers who are taking advantage of classic, well, not classic, but the full .NET framework, if you will. Uh -huh. We don't still have everyone to call and that. So, <laughs> and so they, they have dependencies that aren't portable to .NET Core may still use it and also customers who have proprietary code because the way this works is it's actually shipping dlls to the browser and and resolving those and and running those in net in the browser so if you don't want your code to end up in your user's browser if you want to hide some code then oh, you're probably okay. going to keep it on the server behind an api for that uh, it, well, that's interesting if i if i'm using the um uh, the client side, do people see my code? The, the, will they be able to uh, they can. The source? They'll see my C -sharp code? You can pop open your network tab, you can see DLLs being pulled down, and uh, you the, can see the DLLs, but will they be able to see the C -sharp code? Uh, no, you would be able to decompile that though oh, okay. from the IL basically and oh, okay. get a sense for but what's if happening. If I had some sort of obfuscation tool, I could probably prevent that, I'm guessing. Uh, you could, but obfuscation is not complete security. It's okay. another speed bump in the road. Fair enough. All right. <laughs> but, All right. So security is an issue, uh, offline support is an issue, and um, I say issue on a factor in deciding server side versus client side. Sure. And then uh, where you want your workloads to scale. I right. think if you have uh, lots of calls back to your database, for example. Maybe that belongs on the server. Right. Uh, something yeah. like that. And, and a lot of customers that I'm talking to have existing clients, WPF, or believe it or not, they're still running Silverlight workloads. Okay. And so they already have this distributed environment where the compute's taking place on the client machine. Okay. And so they're looking for a path forward that they can migrate to a modern technology stack still leverage the code that they have, but do it in a way that if you're going with client-side Blazor is compatible now with users who are on Linux, on Mac, on Windows, on different phone devices, et cetera. Well, is there a migration path then for uh, applications written in something like Silverlight to Blazor? 
It depends on how your application was written, but for the most part, let's say you followed the model view, view model pattern mm -hmm. that's supported in Blazor, so okay. you could port your view models over. Now, okay. Silverlight uses XAML right. as a rendering engine, and Blazor uses Razor templates. It's actually so Razor templates that. in the, the browser. That's how Blazor got its name, right. Browser, Razor, Blazor. But um, so you would have to rewrite the UI piece of that. Now, okay. if you have code that's more monolithic where the logic's embedded in the UI, that's obviously going to be a lot more difficult yeah. than if you've abstracted that out. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they've learned not to do that by now. But, right. Um, everybody, was a lot lo everybody was a lot younger when Silverlight was around. That's right. So they can be excused. Yeah. <laughs> you and I were a lot younger. I <laughs> we were. Uh, that's cool. Um, so the, the client side is coming. The server side is available today. Is it just if I have Visual Studio and the .NET Framework installed, uh, and or Visual Studio Code installed? Do I just get that, or do I have to install something else to? Get uh, so, so there is an install step. If you go to Blazor.net, it gives okay. you the instructions. But basically, if you're on the latest stable version of Visual Studio 2019, okay, and then you install the Blazor SDK, mm -hmm. then you have access to to Blazor projects. Okay. And installing the SDK is key. But part of .NET Core 3.0. If you have .NET Core 3.0, you have Blazor server side support. You have to enable preview and install a special preview version to get the latest WebAssembly version, the client side, because that's not that's in stable preview. release. And right. that's, uh, is there a, I, how do I enable that? Is that uh, an application or do I just, just uh, download it? So if you're on a preview version of 2019, it'll be available just to install. Okay. And if you're not, you have to go into settings. So if you're in a stable, Visual Studio 2019, a non-preview. Right. There's a setting that you can search for, go into settings and just search for preview, and there's a checkbox to okay. enable preview workloads. Yeah, a control Q is my favorite. Yeah, yeah is control that Q. it? That's control the one Q. of the upper right corner, you just search for anything, it'll find it in and a it dialog finds box everything. Yeah. somewhere buried in a tab in settings. Yeah, we used <laughs> to say go to this and then click on that and go here, now it's just search for preview, check the it. flag. And it's a VSIX. All right, but you, you, can, you can enable it yourself. It isn't one of these previews where I have to get permission from the product team, for example. Correct. To enroll in it. That's good. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Um, is there anything we haven't talked about that we should have? Uh, the only other interesting thing that comes up a lot when I'm, I'm talking about Blazor is people are looking at how do I migrate my communication stack. And communication it's, stack. Meaning, uh, meaning, for example, a lot of people in the past would have used WCF RIA services. Oh, okay. And uh, the whole advantage of that was that I had this domain model and I can share those classes between the client and the server. So it sort of abstracts the backend REST API calls, mm. or in this case, WCF calls. And when you go to Blazor, you have a few options for that client server communication. You have, there's actually a open source because .NET Core out of the box doesn't support WCF. Okay. But there's a community project that implements a WCF client. Mm -hmm. So that's one option. Okay. There's an option to use the new gRPC protocol, which uh, a lot of people are getting excited about. It's contract-based mm. development and discoverability, so I can set an interface, discover that from my client, and spin up a client that understands how to communicate. Oh, this is the one from Google? Yes. Okay. And then the other one, though, that I find very intriguing is I've been doing a lot with OData. And OData is like, for those not familiar, it's like GraphQL, but it's been out about 10 years longer. Right. And it's a convention for querying and, and manipulating data. Uh -huh. And if you stand up an OData server on your, your server side, a Blazor client can use a very simple OData client, share the exact same classes, validations, behaviors, and I can literally filter over a list using link. I can uh, do collection where this and that, and that gets translated to an API call that ensures the filtering is done on the server, and I only get back the records I want. So oh, it's pretty, pretty so powerful. So it seems ideal for basic CRUD stuff that you yeah. just want to get subsets of data and update a row on the back end and that sort of thing. Yep, absolutely. Awesome. Where are you speaking next? Uh, well, I'm speaking here, VS next Live Chicago, <laughs> tomorrow. But uh, we'll after that, that, I'll be down in Orlando for uh -huh. our big MS Ignite event oh, at the exciting. convention center that takes about two hours to walk from one side to the other. That, yeah. but, uh, so I'll be speaking there. And then I'm going, we 
take that initial conference and we take it on the road. Oh, it's you're part of that. Microsoft Ignite the Tour. Great. I was so, talking to Laurent about that uh, a couple days ago. Yeah, exactly. So I'll get to go to uh, London, Berlin, and Zurich this year for the tour. Pretty excited like about that. Yeah. And then the only other one mixed in there in February, I'll be in Atlanta for Dev Nexus. Jeremy, thanks so much. Thank you. Welcome all of my friends to another chat about technology with my good friend, David.